Hey there. Thanks for tuning in. You ready for another episode of my Bigfoot sighting? All right then. Let's do this. Seen a bunch of run-down new horse towns where the church is the backbone, loves in the bow. And the five-string melodies groove in. Where the roots run deep Beyond the noise of the busy streets Where the songs of the south are soothing When I hear the front porch picking down Home rhythm ringing out I don't run from banjo music Yeah If you'd like to be able to listen to the show without ads and have full access to bonus content, that's an option. To find out how, please go to MyBigfootSighting.com. My Bigfoot Sighting comes from Oklahoma City, specifically west of Oklahoma City on the North Canadian River, in a uh, place called the Stinchcomb Wildlife Refuge. It's an area that... uh, my business partner and friend and I would float regularly. And when I say regularly, I mean on a weekly basis. We might float once a week or we may float five times a week. Something we enjoyed was floating at night. We like floating from point A to point B, not from point B to point B, where you float upriver and come back, or you float out on a lake and you come back to the truck and you have to retract your steps. So there was something about night that was attractive to us. We called it floating in stereo. You know, the, the sounds and the owls and bats would swoop and things like that. But over the years, we would hear odd sounds. I'm not a, what I would call a big footer, no disrespect to anybody that is, uh, because of the way I feel about it now. But what I always called myself was a 15 percenter. I don't want to be wrong. If they pulled a big foot in one day, I was like, well, I gave it a chance. But uh, that's all changed over a 25-year period of floating this North Canadian River. For those that know Oklahoma, I'm originally from southeastern Oklahoma, McAllister, and it's kind of a hot spot down there. I'm sure a lot of Bigfooters will have heard of Hobnobia and then the Wilburton uh, area around the Wilburton Mountains and things like that. That's where I was born and raised, and I hunted there and fished there, and I was in the woods and camped overnight, you know, on a monthly basis. I'm one of those guys that said, well, if there was a Bigfoot out there, I'd have seen one by now type guy, but I hadn't. And really nothing sound wise or anything like that that I couldn't explain. So uh, flash forward to me moving out from McAllister to Oklahoma City and this Stinchcomb wildlife area. We got introduced to kayaks and just fell in love with it. And like I have already said, we love floating at night. Well, this place is overran with beaver. So a lot of tail splashing and things like that would occur. And looking back on it now, I know that all those splashes that I attributed it to beaver wasn't. Every now and then that might have been a rock throw. And I'll get to that a little later on in my story. But we would hear howls and things and we wouldn't hear a howl and go oh that's a bigfoot we'd just hear a howl and think that's unusual as overran with deer as this area is and wildlife in general you would think that there would be more coyotes and uh, coyotes is something that seems to be lacking in this area and to kind of draw you a picture of it it's just an average to smaller size river that floats through Oklahoma from the northwest down to the southeast area. And I floated several hundred miles of this river with no occurrences and nothing that I couldn't explain happening except in this Stinchcomb wildlife area. And that's where everything that I'm about to say has happened. One time we floated down, 
and I noticed a dead deer on the bank right beside the water. And me being a deer hunter, I thought dead deer poacher. I, I never made the leap, dead deer Bigfoot. I didn't get out and examine maybe the first one or two. But when it came down to it, curiosity got the best of me. And the reason why it did is because they kept ending up in the exact same spot. And when I mean the exact same spot, I don't mean I saw one in a spot and saw one 20 yards away and one 50 yards away and one 10 foot away. When I say the same spot, what eventually ended up being eight deer total, they were all in the same exact spot. And like I said, the first one or two I didn't get out and examine maybe by the third one i saw that it was pretty mutilated and messed up and then by the like the fourth one curiosity got the best of me and i banked my uh, kayak and got out and examined it well what i found was a large doe with no apparent bullet holes or anything like that and I reached down to roll her over, and when I did, I grabbed her legs, and it was just crackling and popping, and her whole body moved weird, and she was broken. I felt her ribs. I pushed down on her rib. Every rib that she had was broken. It was like her legs were broken, you know, in each one in five different places. She was really banged up bad, and it's something that later on I've heard other Bigfooters and people say that they've heard reports of Bigfoot snatching them up and then swinging them like a baseball bat against a tree. Well, that rings very true with me now because that's exactly what it was. There was no blood at all. There was no arrow holes or bullet holes or anything like that and the friends and people that i've shared this with are like well maybe it got hit by a car no <laughs> there's no roads anywhere near this an animal a bigfoot killed it and put it there and it's not something that i up for debate or i try to convince people of this or anything like that but after i examined that one then everyone I saw after that, I would get out and look at. And some of them were bucks, some of them were does. There were probably two or three more that were mutilated and had been ate on and things like that. But others were in the shape of the one that I saw were just badly broken. I, to be, People will go, okay, well, you were thinking Bigfoot then. I was just thinking it was awfully dead come odd that all of them were in the exact same spot and in the shape they were and everything like that. But I never hadn't made the leap. I mean, it, it might have been in the back of my mind, but I hadn't made that leap. Hey, there's a Bigfoot out here with us. And there's a property owner adjacent to the Stinchcomb Wildlife Refuge that I've never met. And we had got out one time, just a bathroom break type deal. And I was looking across his fence and down in the distance, probably like a um, hundred yards away, I'll say, there was something really tall standing on two legs, black, and had one arm way up in the air, almost like it was waving at us. And I was like, what, is, you know, what in the world is that? And my partner and I were both confused as we could be. <laughs> it said private property, and anybody listening, I, I don't advise this in, in any manner. But there was a sign that said private property, and we didn't care. We were curiosity got the best of us. So we crossed the fence and crossed this field and walked up on a large iron cutout of a Bigfoot. Now, this was 25 years ago. This isn't your classic Bigfoot 
one arm back, one arm forward, popular image that is sold today or anything like that. This was just a crude cutout, probably weighed 200 pounds of metal that this guy like did in his barn and took out to this field. This was a like a, his little personal gun range. But my partner and I, Chris and I, was like, well, what, what is this? And what, what is this about? It had a, by the way, it had a red kill shot in its chest. And, you know, the guy had backed off and he shot this target, you know, a hundred times probably. And we were like, you know, cracking jokes and like, man, this guy's got it out for Bigfoot. And why did he make this? image as a bigfoot and shoot it why why is this not a wild boar image why why is this not a cut out of a bear why 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 is it a bigfoot well i still don't know and i've told researchers that have talked to me in the past that man you got to go interview find out that property owner and go interview him and ask him why did you do this where all these experiences that i've had happen why did you make it a bigfoot and i I would just be real interested to know but uh at any rate we would do uh these night floats and and it was mainly just me and him and every now and then we would invite friends well eventually i got a girlfriend and she loved kayaking just as much as us and she was similar to us and she didn't care if it was 10 degrees or 110 degrees if we were going kayak and we were going kayak and and she was same like-minded you know night is better than day so uh that's how we floated and uh, the night of my biggest experience i'll say out there there was four of us floating my wife and i and chris and another friend don was with us and it's pitch black almost it's really really dark just a slight slight moonlight and it's about 11 o'clock at night and people a lot of times are interested what time of year it was in the spring late march early april sometime like that and my wife and i had got separated from chris and don we knew they were behind us but we didn't know if they were 50 yards behind us or a half a mile behind us. So we decided to quit paddling and go with the light current that the river provided and just listen to the owls. There were dozens of owls out of this place. So listen to the owls talking back and forth. And we wasn't talking and we wasn't paddling. And it was dark. So at that point, we might as well just been driftwood because we were making no sound whatsoever. And I was floating about 12 to 14 foot from the bank. And my wife, Julie, was about two foot from the bank, three foot from the bank. It was just a drop off. And many of you know that kayak, you don't need much water to float, but she was skirting the bank and uh, I wasn't paying any attention to her and she wasn't paying any attention to me, but uh, she was to my right and something had my attention and I was kind of looking off to the left. Now, mind you, our paddles are the double oared paddles where they're really long and they were sitting right in front of us where half of us stuck out one side and half of us stuck out the other. Me being in the center of the river, there wasn't any problem. I wasn't going to hit anything or brush against anything. She was real close to the bank, but it was pretty much all sand. And uh, I'm looking to my left again, and I hear from my right, you know, my wife gasp. Uh, of just really loud, like I haven't ever heard her gas before. I jerked my head really quickly at her, and she had jerked her head to look at me. And we locked eyes, and she was a tough lady and not one to cry easily. But tears, I mean, almost started shooting out of her her eyes. And I was like, what? what what is going on her mouth was half gapped open and she couldn't get words out and so while i'm saying what 
talk to me what is going on, this large figure rose from behind her. And I'm I'm just in shock. And I, I felt so helpless. I had a gun with me. It was just a little twenty two uh, with some rat shot in it in case things got bad with a water moccasin or or something like that. And I'm gonna tell the listeners that <laughs> That gun would have been no good for anybody. I it, I don't even think during the experience that it passed through my head to to grab that gun. Uh, I was just in shock and awe of what I was seeing. Now, me being 12 to 14 foot away, I didn't get a lot of detail, but I could see its outline perfectly. I could see a little color. It looked more blackish than anything to me and i'll say it's a classic bigfoot look no neck large head extremely thick through the shoulders and the chest and i'm a ceramic tile man by trade so distances and measurements and things like that i mean i live with a tape measure on my side and you know, there might be nine foot, 10 foot, whatever foot, Bigfoot's out there. What I saw was about six, six, but I would estimate the weight at like 500 pounds if I had to guess. And what it did was just silently rose right behind her so close that it could have just reached out and touched her, could have reached out and grabbed her. She never turned to look back. She just locked eyes at me terrified and never looked back over her shoulder but what it did was rise up full stance staring right at me took a quarter to a third of a turn took two maybe three steps into the woods and disappeared so <laughs> what i'm going to say let's take a break from the story for a second and just tell you that this place is so thick and around the river it has so many marshes and kind of little wetland areas and things like that it's not real accessible to get out to and 25 years ago when this happened no one floated and this is not trying to be braggadocious or anything like that we were out enjoying it and we would always say why don't we see people out here? There's a there's almost a million people next to us here in Oklahoma City. You mean to tell me everybody's on one of the couch and they're not out enjoying this? I mean, it's you know, I I would pay to do this, but we never saw anyone. So my point is, I always tell people now that I'm not a fifteen percent or I'm a hundred percent that that was a Bigfoot or a guy in a monkey suit. And you can take your pick. I don't care which. But if it was a guy in a monkey suit, what was the joke? What, what, what? He was shooting extremely long odds that anybody would float by. So here we are, and we float by, and this man in a monkey suit decides to stand up, take two, three steps, and disappear in silence. It just doesn't make any sense. He could have yelled. He could have put on a show. I'd have fell out of my kayak, maybe peed my pants. I don't know what, but it would have been even that much more terrifying. Because like I say, she was terrified. And, and I, I, I don't really categorize me as terrified more than I was just shock and awe of the whole experience and seeing what I was seeing. But it just makes no sense in this almost inaccessible by walking there area and the overwhelming amount of mosquitoes that are in this area and to be in this big giant suit and all of that, that didn't happen. What I saw was a Bigfoot. I'm 100%. Everybody else can debate what I saw but I know what I saw. So 
flashback to real time with her. It was gone. And I'm with her and she still hasn't moved her head from looking at me. And I'm telling her, tell me what you saw. And she cannot get words out. And I'm like, woman, you got to talk to me. I know what I saw. I need to know what you saw. Please, baby, just talk to me, you know. And it probably, I mean, it seemed like a half an hour, but it probably took me five minutes to get her to speak a word. And her story from her point of view was when we was floating and gently going down the river and she saw what she saw she thought there was a big black bush on the edge of the water and when she was floating up to it remember i said we had our paddles in front of us and that they stick out real far so she just went to slightly move her paddle sideways to angle it where it wouldn't get caught up in this bush that she's about to hit with her paddle well when she did that it and it scratched the car across the top of the kayak and made sound and it jerked its head and when it did they locked eye to eye and i'm when i say eye to eye she was two to three foot from this bigfoot and they locked eyes And that's when she gasped real loud, turned her head, looked at me. I turned my head, looked at her. It stood, turned, and silently walked away. And I was like, tell me, you got to tell me more. And uh, she said it was more a brown, brown, red. And... I was like, well, you, I mean, you were right on it. What, what was its eyes like, you know? And she said its eyes were coppery, orangey, coppery kind of colored eyes. And she said it was like it looked straight into her soul. And it was shocked, genuinely shocked, she said, and as, as well as she was. But it, it was like, how did I let these humans get this daggum close to me? And, you know, his reaction, uh, you know, after she only saw it crouch down, what it was, what the reason why she thought it was a bush is it didn't seem to be moving. But looking back on it, it was crouched down drinking from the river is what it was doing when we silently, stealthily floated up on it and caught it completely off guard. And we continued our float and got out and came back and. We talked about it over the years and everything, and she had nicknamed it Littlefoot because what she saw was only three and a half, four foot tall because of it being crouched. She never saw it standing like I did in the sheer bulk and the size and all of that. And and I've floated, uh, you know, a number of years since then, probably around thirty to thirty-five years total. I don't float, and I'm. 56 now about to be 57 and i don't float as much as i used to Uh, it's a rare occasion where i get out there anymore but it was by far the strangest oddest thing and i just remember all of it like it was yesterday and since this has happened again i'm sorry for skipping around but that's my one and only time in 30 plus years to actually see one but after i saw it then all the noises all the tree knocking sounds all these splashes or some of these splashes you know a lot of them were obviously beaver but some of these splashes i started attributing to bigfoot and then it made me wonder what i had missed in all the prior years leading up to that event but since that has happened unfortunately julie is my lay wife she passed away due to cancer and i've continued on with my life and i take friends out there on occasion and i had a female with me one night 
and it was her birthday. I, and I had asked her earlier that day, what do you want to do? It's your birthday. She said, I want you to take me floating at night. And we went floating and we was talking and uh, laughing and m making a lot of racket. And out of nowhere, we both heard this click, 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 click. We looked over to our right and a huge rock was coming out of the woods and the clicking was it hitting limbs on the way out and it fell right beside her and if it would have hit her it would have easily broke anything that it hit and could have killed her very easily as well it was thrown directly at her and i don't know who won the shot put in the last olympics but there is no way on god's green earth that he could have thrown this rock this far. What threw that rock was not human. It was too big and too far. And this gal was a little bit crazy. She banked her kayak, jumped out, ran into the woods because she had known about my other stories. And she was the type that she was eager. She craved wanting to see a Bigfoot. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. And it, it was dusk at this time. And she ran in the woods. I banked my kayak, ran after her. Long story short, we didn't see anything. But I started looking around, and, and I was like, you know, there's not a rock anywhere around here. There's not a pebble. There's not a piece of gravel or anything. Where did that rock come from? Well, we got back into our kayaks i said we, we got to get it. it's it's getting dark and i don't want to be on land like as i kind of feel vulnerable to <laughs> whatever's out of here so we got in our kayaks and started floating down no sooner did we start floating down we started hearing a ch -ch 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 -ch, and it was like a march in the woods just out of sight i mean it, it had to have been just out of sight but it was marching along with our pace as we went down the river and uh she's <laughs> screaming and hollering and then like do you hear that i was like how could i not hear that you know you hear that and i was like i hear it girl and she's like that's not four-legged that's not four-legged i've owned horses my whole life that's two-legged and i said listen you don't have to convince me Remember, I'm the one that claims to have seen a Bigfoot. I know that's too far. I know what that is. And yes, it's following us. And we kept floating and kept listening to it. Well, at some point, maybe after a couple hundred, 300 yards, it started, the footsteps started drifting off into the woods and started getting uh, where we could hear them less and less and less. So we pulled over at this kind of what it has become a popular beach on the opposite side of the river from what had happened and uh, just stopped. And we was talking and like, can you believe that? Oh, my God, it happened. It's too bad that you didn't get to see it. And in the middle of talking. I hear a loud screech and scream, and, and then I hear a grunting and a uh, 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 and then a whoof sound. And the woof sound, it was like a it was like a fist hitting a pillow. And the screaming got louder and louder and louder. And it was just dead silence. Well, me knowing what deer sound like that was a deer getting killed and pummeled to death and she said let's get out of here man and we jumped in our kayaks and left and and that's kind of the end of that story but a few years later my current girlfriend that i have now similar situation what do you want to do tonight man i want to go float at night she had never been i had taken her during the daytime but i had never taken her at night and this is exactly how it went down we was floating 
and no sooner we start floating. This was one of those where I we only used one vehicle, so we had to do the what I call a point A to point A float, not a point A to point B where you leave a vehicle dropped off. So we did have to retrace our steps. And we're floating up, and no sooner did we start, a uh, water moccasin crosses us. And I was like, well, this is the end of this trip. And she was like, no, no, let's go. Let's keep going. And we kept going up. And a beaver started coming across and splashed his tail. And I was like, well, she's not going to like that. And she said, let's keep going. And there was a moccasin in a tree that dropped down out of a tree. And uh, that one almost got her. But again, she said, let's continue on. So we're floating. And again, her and I are talking, yucking it up, laughing, whatever. And exactly the same thing happens where a huge rock gets thrown at us. And you know we see it in the air before it hits the, the water. No full well, it was not a beaver or anything like that. And it hit the water and we both were stunned. So I kind of was, we were wide eyed at me looking at her and her looking at me. And both of us realizing that a man didn't throw that rock. And we were being dead silent. And (laughs) I screamed as loud as I could scream at what I'm saying and what I know in my heart was a Bigfoot that threw that rock. And I didn't get any sound back or anything like that. I did get an awfully dirty look from my girlfriend. And she said, I'm going to kill you when we get back to the truck. But she said, let's go. And so we turned around and went back. And um, that's pretty well my stories from that area. But all these occurrences all happen within about a half a mile to a mile. The rock throws, the dead deer, where I actually saw the Bigfoot, all happened in a less than a mile span of this river and like i said i've floated hundreds of miles on this river and i don't have any odd stories or things that i can't explain from any of the other areas but uh, as they say that's my story and i'm sticking to it it's changed the way i look at things and the way i attribute sounds and uh, pay a lot more attention now and I've been interviewed before, and I was actually featured on Finding Bigfoot, and no disrespect to them, but I did not like the way they covered the story and the other stories that the other people told here in Oklahoma. I just didn't think that they um, did a very good job. They asked questions, and uh, they were out in the field, but they roll with a group. You know, there's four of them, but they had a crew of 20. And in my thinking, the only way that we got that close to that Bigfoot the night that we saw one was because we was completely 100% stealth. I don't think one's going to have to be very distracted or you're going to have to be super duper stealth to sneak up on one like we were and i know there's and no disrespect again to the people that think bigfoot is a supernatural creature or anything like that but i just don't think two people from oklahoma in kayaks could sneak up on a supernatural creature in my mind it's a flesh and blood type deal they're super super rare i've seen an interview with a yellowstone national park ranger that said he's never seen a bear that had died from natural causes so when people say well why haven't we seen a dead one why have they brought in a dead one well yellowstone's got a couple bears (laughs) and if he's never seen one then there's your answer right there and again it's a story i tell and For those that accept it, wonderful, and those that don't, I hope you've at least been entertained by my story. And but every word of it is just how it happened. I don't have to 
exaggerate anything or anything like that. It's just kind of how it went down. Since then, I haven't experienced anything, but again, I don't float near as much as I used to. And that's pretty much it. And I hope that you've enjoyed the story. And I appreciate Vic for having me on to tell my story. My Bigfoot sightings both happened in Pennsylvania. My first sighting happened in uh, December of 2016, be the first Saturday of rifle season. It's a cold morning in Pennsylvania. We went out to my deer stand about 6 o'clock. It's still dark. Crawled up into my stand and was sitting there for first light. In Pennsylvania, you sit in your stand, you let the light come up and usually the birds are chirping and squirrels are running around and stuff but that wasn't happening this Saturday. The woods were an eerie quiet like there wasn't a breeze and nothing it was super quiet to the part where it was like not natural for Pennsylvania woods so I sat in my stand for two hours or so basically Sat around till I got bored enough where I said, I'm going to go on a walk, see if I can't kick up something, because absolutely nothing was moving that day. So I crawl out of my stand there and start hiking up to what we call the old pasture field. As my uh, grandfather used to farm that property, and he had a pasture field in between the upper woods and the lower woods. It was starting to grow up some, so I, I walked up there to cut over to what we called the locust thicket, which was a small patch that had was mainly locust trees, but it was covered in brush all the whole way around it. And I go up, I cut over, I start crawling through this thick brush, and as soon as you get through the brush, it opens up. And as soon as I got through the brush and was cleaning myself up and checking everything, every hair on my body stood up because this eerie feeling of being watched and that's when it hit me the pungent smell of like a wet dog got sprayed by a skunk and i'm sitting there and i'm looking around and there on the top of this small hill i should rephrase this when i came in i came in kind of a bit of a valley there was a little washway that water sat in, and there's a hill on both sides of me. And on my right side, I looked up on the top of the hill, and there was this tall, dark, dark brown figure staring down at me. We locked eyes and just stared at each other. I, I completely froze. I had no idea what was going on. But the entire time we had locked eyes, I kept hearing movement behind me until the movement behind me stopped and I could feel breathing down the back of my neck and something started tapping me, not aggressively, like a curious what's going on kind of tap. And the one on the hill never broke eye contact with me or not, but hooped at whatever was poking me. The one that was poking me stopped, walked away till I couldn't hear it anymore. And me and this one on the hill kept eye contact for, I honestly don't know how long. It felt like we were there for an eternity, but it could have only been 10 minutes or so. Was, I can't really tell you how long we were there. But uh, and eventually, it stood up because it was kind of crouched down. Not like down on its knees, but like if you went to pick something up, but you didn't want to get down kind of thing. It was kind of crouched there. It stood up and basically did another whoop at me and started moseying off not even in a hurry just didn't even give a crap kind of thing just wanted to just start walking off didn't even care i was there kind of thing and then 
it walked off to I, I couldn't hear it anymore and I kind of just stood there in disbelief for a while and then I eventually got my composure together and decided I was I was done hunting for the day and I went up met up with my dad and we decided nothing was moving and we were going to go home and that's basically my first sighting my second actual sighting happened just this year during deer season again at a different location it's still in pennsylvania here but closer to home i was up hunting at my uh cabin and once again another dead morning kind of thing and i actually didn't leave my stand this time but i kept feeling this being watched kind of you'd hear some noise but you'd look around and see nothing so considering what i know now I took my cell phone out and turned it to the selfie mode and lifted it up over my shoulder. Now I could see, I can't give you a clear description of it because it wasn't great, but you could see this figure poke out behind a tree. But when you turn around to look at it, it poked back behind the tree. And we did this for about a half hour until eventually it just vanished. I'm not sure where it went or how it went anywhere without me hearing it, but it just kept poking out and poking back in. But that's my uh, second sighting. And then well, I do a lot of Bigfoot investigations where one time I was up at the same place as my second sighting. I heard some really good vocalizations in the middle of the night, like they sounded like they were right outside my uh, cabin there. It would be, uh, if I remember correctly, about 3 o'clock in the morning. And the only way I can really describe it to you is if someone took the Ohio how and you put a pair of headsets on, turned it up to 100, and left it go. And other times, and I've heard knocks, uh, tree structures, other times where... You couldn't really prove anything was there, but, you know, your dog's hair stands up and she starts growling and there's absolutely nothing there for her to do that. And usually when she's in the woods, she just wants to chase whatever's out there, like squirrels and such. But these times it was more tucked between my legs and she'd sit there and growl. But that's about it for my uh, sightings. Well, that's it for tonight's show. If you've had a Bigfoot sighting and would like to be a guest, please go to MyBigfootSighting.com and let us know. Thanks for listening. Have a great night. Seen a bunch of run-down new horse towns Where the church is the backbone, loves in the bow And the five-string melodies groove in With the farmland rows where the roots run deep Beyond the noise of the busy streets where the songs of the South are soothing When I hear the front porch picking down home rhythm ringing out I don't run from banjo music Yeah